Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Finlay Johnson. I'm the interim CEO for the Association for Electronic Music. AFEM is the not-for-profit, democratically run international trade body for the entire ecosystem of electronic music, from labels to live, managers to media, technology to talent, conferences to consultants, and publishers for more than many more. Um, part of our work is uh, around metadata, and we have a metadata working group whose mission statement is to create and signpost to credible metadata education resources to help members manage their assets and rights across the digital supply chain and identify metadata issues relating to electronic music, connecting with key partners to influence change, identify and encourage best practice and adoption of existing solutions. AFEM, in conjunction with our democratically elected chairs, Chloe Johnson and Charlie Phillips, have decided to run this metadata workshop specifically aimed at artists, DJs, writers and creators as part of a series. Just a bit of housekeeping, this session will be recorded and made available online afterwards, so feel free to keep your camera or microphone off to ensure the smooth running. However, we would encourage questions in the chat function as we'll be tracking these and creating a document of FAQ made available afterwards and the recorded section at the end will be separate um, for uh, the presentation on YouTube. Um, so now I would like to pass you over to Chloe and Charlie. Thank you. And so I'll be kicking us off. Just going to quickly share my screen. Excellent. Um, so yeah, as Finley mentioned, this is the first of actually three uh, webinars that will be running as part of the metadata working group. And we are focused in this session primarily on uh, the actual creators of the electronic music that is out in the ecosystem, the DJs, producers, songwriters that are uh, making this music and how um, we as an industry can support them, how I'm speaking, I'll be speaking to the creators themselves on this call, but I know we have a member, a number of people from other working groups that are here. So please feel free to also ask questions of those who are in attendance today in the webinar. There'll be people, for example, from Buma and PRS and Unison that are here from the CMO side. So please feel free to also ask those folks in the chat as we go along. So the first reason why we're here, why good data matters uh, is kind of the most obvious elephant in the room is you might not get paid if there is bad data. Um, so if you think about this from all the different places where data can exist across the internet, now that we have digital music, um, right from the creator side where you are creating this music and you are distributing it either on, by yourself or through a publisher or a label, um, and then they, you have societies and distributors who are going off and collecting the rights and the royalties that are generated from uh, those plays, performances, streams, downloads, etc., and then putting that music kind of those royalties back through the supply chain back to the creator. Um, so there's lots of different types of usages that exist. Um, we'll get into a little bit about that later in the webinar. Um, and there's also lots of different territories, types of rights, UGC, user generated content, et cetera, that might exist. Um, so if there's one or two places where there maybe is a weak link in the chain, maybe there's missing information, maybe you have rights that are reverting back to you after you've left a label deal, et cetera, you can end up with kind of funky data and that actually might end up in you not receiving everything uh, in your royalty statements or at least not receiving them in a timely manner. Um, even if the data is completely perfect in all of the different parts of the supply chain, you also can suffer from another problem, which is just lots of different derivative content to keep track of. Um, so as an example, my friend Holt here um, has a song called Mislead. He also has his own extended remix of that song that he has released. Um, and he also has a friend or a producer that's done a remix of it. You also have different versions that he mixes live that might exist on internet compilations, et cetera. And he also might have a stem that he has monetized through um, selling a beat pack or selling something, uh, project stems, et cetera, to his community. So lots of different um, versions of that master can exist in the world. Lots of different derivative content can exist. Um, so you also want to make sure that you're grouping all of those back together in some kind of sensible way and you're making sure that you're registering and letting everyone know that these are linked recordings to a particular composition or work that has been created. Um, and actually having that type of linkage or being able to get down to the really granular pieces of your song, the samples, stems, et cetera, in order to actually track those across derivative content on the um, internet 
is actually leading to an opportunity. Um, so there's lots of different new opportunities, especially for electronic musicians in my, in my view, um, that exist now that we are seeing new types of rights and monetization, um, VR, video games, TikTok, short form video, and things like that, that uh, really do cater to people who are creating music that is dynamic. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, some of the growth that we're seeing, some of the um, interesting opportunities are in spaces like VR, for example, or adaptive music, um, where actually if you have music that can very easily or fluidly be sped up or change key or change mood based on where a user is in that VR experience that really enhances the exper immersion experience for those users. And so your music is going to be much more attractive, much more licensable than a sort of steady track. Um, so spaces like that and being able to uh, create uh, user tools and things that might be in a DAW, for example, are also really interesting places that if you're an electronic music producer and you were interested in finding other spaces, other uses for your music, it doesn't always have to be kind of the standard master track, et cetera. And also we get into the space of derivative works, bootlegs, uh, live music, uh, music that only exists for one special night uh, in a David Guetta set, for example. And how do we track those uses? How can we go back to original works of those? How can we encourage creators who are creating this derivative content, either through new legislation or new ways of tracking and monetizing rights, open up this world for people who want to do the right thing, want to do the legal thing, um, but are also wanting to express themselves and create music that is inherently sampling and using other uh, original content. So just bearing that in mind that this space that we're in as electronic music producers and as a sort of DJ and producer community, are handling and dealing with a, a space or a genre of music that isn't as standard as, you know, a rock tune that's going to have the composition and the one master everyone knows. Uh, and a space that I think is interesting for this problem um, that we'll kind of touch on in the second webinar, which is how the music industry itself can support this, um, is when you start looking at things like online sets or radio uh, performances or, you know, online performances of a normal DJ set that might contain continuous music or will contain continuous music and might contain um, special remixes that only exist for that one performance and how do we track and how do we make sure that we're paying the right people. Um, so on that vein, tracking live performances is also really important. I think a lot of times when people think about metadata, they're really kind of, uh, they, what comes to mind is the master recording, streaming, et cetera. Um, but that's not necessarily where um, electronic music producers, creators are making the majority of their money. They are making money from touring, playing gigs, um, DJing. And so making sure that you have uh, a lace or that you are set up with a CMO and that you're putting cue sheets in and you're making sure that you're tracking your own performances is also really an important space to consider. And that all does track down to making sure you have metadata and you understand what song you're playing, who wrote the song, who recorded the song. Um, same thing in the clearing samples world. So samples are very often used. Either somebody's using royalty free, like a splice sample, or they're going off and obtaining the licenses that you need in order to clear a kind of well-known song. Um, or maybe you are being sampled and you want to make sure that you have uh, monetized or made sure those licenses are cleared for those who want to sample your music. Um, and that kind of goes into monetizing project files or stems or creating um, unique bundles that you're selling to fans to create their own derivative music, doing remix contests, that kind of thing. And again, making sure that you just know where all of your music and uses of that music are now existing out online. And then finally, going into that online set and radio performances, I don't know uh, how many of you have seen the recent Spotify AI DJ, um, but it's to me showing a trend that people are wanting more of a curated experience. They want mixed music. They don't want just a simple playlist kind of bleeding one into another. Um, and so I think this is a really good opportunity for ourselves as creators, as DJs, to make sure that we are exploring those options, exploring how we can curate those as humans and beat the AI algorithms. No offense to Spotify if you're listening. <laughs> um, so there's a couple different 
um, uh, companies that I've just showed on the screen here that you can take a look at, make sure you're familiar with the services they offer. Um, they might be of interest to you either as a company that's listening in or as an artist to just understand what those services are and how you can uh, make sure you're monetizing your music. And I'm now going to hand off to my colleague, Charlie. Hi, everyone, and thanks very much, Chloe, for your excellent words. And thanks, Finley, and the wider AFM community for, for, for having us do this, uh, this session. Um, as Chloe mentioned, this is, this, today's session is one of three. Um, today's focus is really on kind of the creative side of music. And then in the future sessions, which we'll be doing in the coming weeks, we'll be looking a little bit more at sort of how the industry actually caters for the requirements of the, the kind of creative side of music. Um, and we'll do a little bit of kind of future gazing as to where change might need to come from in order to accommodate some of the, the kind of you know, future uses of music that, that Chloe touched on. But to kind of bring things down to the here and now from the kind of creative point of view, what we thought would be a very useful thing to talk about today is just to really remind ourselves of what the, what what it is that actually makes money in music so on the screen there in front of you it says data equals money because of rights okay that's fine but sometimes these concepts are interchangeable sometimes they're a little bit hard to get your head around um so i think it might be useful just to take a a minute just to remind ourselves what music is actually made up of in terms of rights contributions and basically who did what in order to be clear on where money comes from on subsequent usage of, of music. So Chloe, if you don't mind just clicking the, uh, the, the slide through to the next, the next one. Um, again, so just a reminder, this, everyone on this call will be more than familiar with what's on the screen there, but I still think it's very, very helpful to continually remind yourself I mean I, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer I've been working in music for a long long time but I still come back to the, the kind of equation like okay which of the elements is this problem actually relating to in terms of the intrinsic rights element of the music that is whatever the question you know focuses on the, the, the question that I'm dealing with because it's very 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 easy especially in electronic music where the kind of contributor roles are very blurred a lot of the time to get tripped up on whether or not you're talking about, for example, collective licensing of your publishing and songwriter rights versus your performer rights on a recording, which would be you know, the kind of neighboring rights, for example. But when you're putting together a package of data that's describing your music or music that you've created with other collaborators, Ultimately, the way the world is right now, what you're seeing on the screen are really the three kind of core categories of what makes up a piece of recorded music. So I put the little sort of dotted lines there because even if you're, I mean, maybe not quite so much, but even if you are a solo electronic producer and you're just using Logic or you're just using Ableton and it's only you making the, you know, pressing export and the audio file comes out at the end, boom, off it goes, you put artwork on it, you get all your data together, you register it with your publishing CMO, your label releases it for you onto the DSPs. We'll come onto this in a moment in a little bit more detail, but even if you're an individual person, you still technically have all three of those rights that you need to manage in order to be paid and to recognize the the contribution that you made obviously in commercial music production there are usually collaborations there are sometimes there are songwriters who are nothing to do with the you know the kind of recorded bit sometimes the record companies are completely separate to the writers and the performers that's you know we all know about that um but going back to what chloe was, chloe was saying earlier there is a, a continual kind of cross-reference going on in electronic music where even if you think back to many years ago just just the concept of sampling is you know it's intrinsic to what we do but in each sample there will be somewhere in along the line a question mark over who was the composer who had the you know the idea of a musical work 
is there a publisher involved in that particular song or, 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 or sort of piece of theoretical music then was there somebody who then played that was there then an entity that recorded it well there must be if it was sampled otherwise you wouldn't have the sample to be able to sample so very quickly you can see a huge kaleidoscopic mishmash of potential interests in any instance where you're basically reusing as chloe said other you know other existing creative work but i think just to come back you know full circle my my way of looking at this is kind of it's a sort of linear process you come up with the idea then you kind of perform that idea and turn it into audio and then at some point that audio gets captured and you end up having a recording it's not quite as simple as that but i think the kind of sequence that the sequence reflects the historical development of kind of copyright law because obviously recording came a lot later than people you know playing instruments so you know, that th there's a kind of logical sort of legal um, kind of rationale for having these three things kind of next to each other. But there's also another way of looking at it. And Chloe, if you don't mind just sticking the next slide up. Um, some of you may have seen this diagram before. I was doing a similar session um, a couple of weeks ago and somebody pointed out to me that this looks a bit like a shark. And I was thinking, oh my God, it's a shark flying, it's sort of swimming towards you. But they were saying, no, 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 it's a shark swimming away from you. So this very quickly got called the shark butt diagram. So <laughs> here's the shark butt diagram. And again, I've used this in many other contexts, but it's just a way of kind of visualizing what we saw on the previous slide, that in recorded music, the three contributing elements all exist alongside each other. So it's just the same as the previous slide, but it's just a way of looking at all those three rights interests in a single place. And Chloe, if you just press the next uh, the next button and maybe again. There we are. <clears throat> just as we were discussing earlier, what's quite tricky in electronic music is that very often because the contributor roles, particularly around composer and performer, but also to a great extent, you know, a lot of solo independent artists are also obviously recording and producing their own finished audio. You've got to make sure that your data is in in check for each of those three rights elements, which can be pretty hard to navigate. So if we move on to the next slide. I'm not going to go round the houses on this. This is really just for reference. But the point that I was trying to make on this slide is to simplify as much as possible exactly what Chloe was saying a moment ago with all of the different lists of places where data needs to go. If you are a creator, is there a sort of single conceptual map that you can have in your mind when you're in the process of releasing a piece of music or you're just about to finish recording something just have this image in your mind that the reason why or where your data needs to go for your songwriter element is out to the collective management organizations they're going to be going out there the prs's boomer stemmers of this world will be out there collecting for that element they're not collecting for your sound recording rights and they won't be collecting for particular uses that the other entities might be but just bear that in mind and then if you're thinking about your performer contributions again you'll need to talk to your producer that's why there's a red line for data going between performing artist and record company the record company needs to know what you did on those records in order for them to be able to either license it on or pay you for those contributions and likewise for the record company bit, lots of arrows pointing in and out of the record company section because they've got the kind of final product of the recording that embodies the other two elements. They need to know a lot about what that recording item has going on with it in terms of who wrote the song, who are the performers, blah, 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 so that they can go out and commercialize that, feed the right data out into the ecosystem. When the market ecosystem uses the recording, the money comes back and the label can then allocate that money properly so that the correct participants on the recording get paid. That's pretty much the kind of overview that I was hoping might set the scene. So Chloe gave a fantastic overview of kind of where the complexities lie in terms of today's marketplace. 
I hope this kind of explains in relatively simple terms the core elements of the kind of the anatomy of recorded music to try and help you guys kind of or anyone who's who's watching this kind of just understand where to start to navigate where the rights and where the money should be and where the data needs to come in to, 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 to actually kind of describe the participate participation. Um, but I think on, on that note, I think, Chloe, you had some examples of what this actually looks like, which marries up your earlier discussion with the, the kind of theoretical grounding to bring it all to life a little bit. So I'm just conscious there's a question um, in the chat. Shall we quickly deal with that? I'm not quite sure, Finley, how you want to deal with that, whether we deal with it later or... We can handle the, the questions towards the end. If you want to okay. um, skip on to the, to the Chloe section, we'll, we'll pick up afterwards. Sure. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I think um, one thing I would also just add to those who are maybe watching this or looking at this and thinking this is really complicated and I'm never going to figure this out. I just want to put my music on SoundCloud. <laughs> um, I think, you know, if you are an independent uh, musician and you you don't have a label, you don't have a publisher yet, or you are your own label, you are your own publisher, um, you know, and you are using a service like TuneCore or CD Baby to distribute your music, the advice here is also just to make sure you do understand the publishing side and who you need to register with as a publishing administrator, whether you go um, with someone like a song trust or a CD Baby Pro that's going to be handling some of the publishing admin for you as well. Um, and also making sure that you're registered with CMOs for the collection of your performing and mechanical rights, et cetera. Um, that's the main thing is just making sure that you do take a look at the rights picture and who you're registered with, who's currently monetizing your music, and just making sure that these three um, sections that Charlie has have somebody looking at it for you, if that makes sense, whether that's a manager, label, publisher, or if you're doing it yourself, that there is at least you are registered with a, a company or a service that's handling those rights for you, and then you should be good. Uh, so putting this into kind of a real life example, if put to putting that in air quotes, because it's a fake example, <laughs> but I've come up with a great idea called My Great Song, right? Um, and I started actually doing the, just the music. I wrote some beats. I pulled some ideas together. Um, let's say I'm using Ableton because that's my dog of preference personally. Um, and then I had a, a songwriter come in and collaborate with me and we wrote some lyrics and she put down a vocal track for this. So there's now in my recording, my great song, I have music, which is a composer author type of right, um, who are administrated by publishers. And there's also some lyrics, which is an author or a sort of lyricist uh, part of the song. And that's also in the realm of publishing with publishers representing that. But there are two kind of, uh, depending on which territory you are in, they're also handled slightly differently. Um, I also, let's say in the production of this, decided I do wanna use some samples and I have a couple options of how I wanna put those in. So I could interpolate, meaning that I take the baseline and I redo it myself with different synths, with different sounds. And so it's no longer, it's not me taking the actual recording. Um, or I could just pull the actual recording in there, manipulate it, et cetera, but it still is in present in my song would be that recording. Um, either way, I do have to clear the license from both the label, as Charlie mentioned, and with the composers and the publishers. Uh, and I need to make sure that I do that before I send this out, or else I might be falling foul of some copyright uh, legislation there. Then I'm all ready, I'm ready to go. I've got my master, I've mastered the song. I'm happy with how it sounds and I'm ready to put it out into the world. Um, the metadata that's now part of that master are things like who is the main artist? Do I have a featuring artist? Um, is my vocalist gonna be credited as a featuring artist, for example? Do I have other producers that worked on this with me? Do I have any people who worked on the mixing for me, sound engineers, et cetera, that I need to credit. And then also who is my label or who am I putting in that CNP line when I send this out for distribution? And then finally, there's the kind of uh, descriptive metadata, if you will, and sometimes subjective metadata where you have things like boring things like title, what am I gonna call the song? Um, what is the genre of this music? Is it house? Is it dubstep? Um, what is the beats per minute? What's the duration of the song? That kind of thing. And also you might have more quote subjective metadata genres kind of in there, but things like the mood and 
um, it, things that might be describing how and where that music could be found in a sync placement or a playlist. So all of these kind of elements of your song have metadata characteristics, have different names, special codes that need to go with it. We won't, I think, go into any of the codes today, but we will put some resources at the end. Um, and when this goes up online on YouTube, you'll have in the description section, like re resources and links out to where you can find out what is an ISRC, what's an ISWC, what's an IPI, why do I need to know these, these codes, right? Um, and then holistically, as this is going out, there are deal terms or contracts or how do I monetize this music out in the ecosystem? Um, and the three main things in any contract, which you might be familiar with from like signing a lease on an apartment, <laughs> or where can I have this right for how long and what is the type of contract? So that applies to any old contract and especially in the music industry. A lot of times you'll see worldwide deals for territory, but as we'll actually see in this example, you can have split ownership across different territories, different people representing you in different territories. Uh, your term might be a year, it might be 10 years, it might be life plus 70, whatever that uh, contract says. And then the type of right is going to describe what that person's collecting for you. Are they collecting mechanical royalties? Are they collecting performance royalties? Are they collecting everything, right? Um, so there's generally some deal terms that go into effect once you put this music out into the world via a, uh, a service that allows you to do that. Okay, so let's say it's out there and it's generating some spins. <laughs> um, and so I'm doing really well in the Netherlands. Uh, one of the writers is a Netherlands writer, let's say. And then outside in the rest of the world, I'm also doing pretty good, right? So what does this mean? Well, in this example, you have to look back at the terms, who's collecting for you and where. Um, and in this case, writer one has a Netherlands publisher, Warner Chapel Netherlands, um, and they are self-published in the Netherlands. Uh, and their societies, there are Boom Mastemra. And actually, uh, or sorry, they're self-published rest of world. <laughs> and their society in the Netherlands is Boom Mastemra. And then the rest of the world, their society is PRS. Two people on the call today, if you have any questions. Um, so what that means is that those royalties that are generated are going to filter back through different people, potentially. And if I have that wrong, please correct me in the chat, and I'd be happy to be wrong about that. Um, and then let's say you have a second writer who actually has worldwide deals, one with UMPG, and then their society collecting worldwide for all the rights, let's just call them all the rights for now, uh, is Buma Stemmer in this case. So those money is coming in for Netherlands usages are coming in uh, in this kind of way and then the rest of the world also kind of filtering into the different buckets if you will. The same kind of split ownership across territories can happen in labels too. It's less common but it definitely does happen where let's say you have a deal with a label in the Netherlands and you, that record label goes through Fuga as their distributor and then for the rest of the world you actually maybe are self-releasing under a name called CJ Records, and you're using ADA, let's say, for that distribution. So again, those royalties, depending on the territory and how the usages are going, are going to fall into slightly different buckets. Um, these are kind of the most complex versions of the examples because I wanted to give people a sense of why metadata is so important to make sure you have right, because uh, you want to make sure that the right people know where they need to go to collect money for you. Uh, but in a lot of cases, hopefully it's a little bit more simple. You have one publisher, one society, and one label. And then finally, just to remind you that those samples are in the song. So uh, depending on how I've cleared those licenses, royalties need to go back to those people as well. And in this case, actually, we'll say that the uh, negotiation and the licensing of the publishing side was the deal was, hey, writer two is going to be credited, and it's going to be a new work. This new derivative work credits that songwriter for use of the publishing, and so they're just going to get royalties as per usual. Um, and for the recorded side, let's say I did just use the recording, I've licensed, I've paid in advance to that label uh, as per the agreement, and I'm also going to pay some amount of subsequent royalties out of my master recording payments, uh, which is a called the rollover. So <laughs> all that being said, um, there are also some examples that I wanted to share with you about common things that I see, at least working with data in the electronic music industry that are by no means a, a bad thing, that is what I'm about to show you, but it's just common things to be aware of that may or may not um, cause metadata headaches for people and how to just be aware of, of these sort of common things. Um, so the first is 
you are writing and releasing music under a pseudonym or under an alias, maybe you have a secret artist project and so you're leaving off intentionally leaving off the comp composer information from your label copy in the credits that are on uh, DSPs like Spotify. And that's the case we have here. I don't think I'm uh, stepping on anyone's toes. I think this is fairly common knowledge now that GRX is an alias of one of Martin Garrix's aliases. So Martin Harrison as a writer name is actually one of the composers that could be or could have been credited in the credits here, but is missing on Spotify. Um, now, someone like Buma. So Buma, I think probably represents both of these writers since they're both the Netherlands writers. Um, would have a record of this recording in their system. They would have the work to recording all matched up. So it's not gonna affect the actual payment of the use of this song um, when it comes through the performing societies in any way, as long as those recordings are connected. But something to be aware of if you're not maybe as abreast of how this needs to be registered and therefore you didn't sign up with a CMO and you think, hey, just putting stuff out on Spotify via CD Baby is enough. It wouldn't be enough in this case because Buma wouldn't know to go look for this recording of yours because there's not enough information about that composer for them to go and do that. Um, so again, just it's kind of the point I'm making here is it's important to let your CMOs and your publishers know if new recordings are coming out, especially if you're using a name that is not uh, your typical artist name or even using a name that is um, affiliated in any other way with your composer name. And then just a, a note on third-party matching. So again, in these cases, I'm fairly certain that Buma Stemmer would know that these recordings represent one of their writers, Julian Dobenberg. Um, but because of the way that the uh, labels have put the different writer names in the label copy versus J versus Julian, um, it actually affects a third party, like a Verify, um, being able to find a clean match for those because of the fact that an initial is not really enough information to know that that is the individual we are talking about. Um, so the difference at the top there, a song called Attention, um, there was a false match found, Tarsia Smith with TJ Smith instead of Timmy Trumpet. <laughs> and so, you know, how many people in the world are called T Smith and how many people called T Smith have written a song called Attention? Turns out at least two, right? So again, if you have the opportunity and if you are self-releasing and you can put full names in and you don't mind putting full names in and kind of putting your full name on the track, it definitely does help third-party systems. Again, this wouldn't affect Julian's ability to get paid if he's telling his societies and his publishers, hey, this recording is mine. Um, but again, in, in the world where third parties uh, systems, people like in the US with the MLC, even DSPs trying to go and auto match this themselves, there might be these issues where the full name helps you get a match, the initials not really enough. So those are a couple of examples, hopefully not too overwhelming. <laughs> um, we do have about 25 minutes left for our webinar and Charlie and I have a few questions that we are going to uh, banter back and forth in a discussion. And then as Finley said, we'll, we'll wrap up the formal part of the webinar and um, have a, a space for questions that you've been putting in the chat. So please do put a few more in if you have any more questions and we'll be compiling a list at the end that will also be linked in the description if you're watching this after the fact on YouTube <laughs> um, with some of the outcomes of that discussion. So I will stop sharing, see our lovely faces. All right, so Charlie, I'm gonna kick it to you first actually, because when we were preparing for this webinar, I think one of the things that I was really interested in because it does come up a lot when I'm talking to artists is this space of catalog transfer, movement of catalog, whether you are uh, signing to a label, you're getting rights back from a label, you are, changing distributors as an indie musician, like in all the different things that come with that. Um, so I guess, yeah, what advice do you have? What things have you seen in the world in that world, in that space? Great. Well, I mean, many of you probably know that I worked for the indie label community for about 10 years. So I've got quite a lot of insight as to into kind of some of the, the kind of issues that affect the kind of independent record label world. And whilst today's session is kind of focusing on creators, there's not that much of a difference a lot of the time between 
a creator and an entity actually making recordings. And in some respects, creators have a catalog of their own recordings, especially in electronics. So one of the things we also talked about was how to untangle things like multiple single deals that a creator might do for multiple labels. But we'll come on to that in a moment. I think with regard to catalog transfers, I mean, there's a whole mass of problems that can occur. Um, but I think if, if I can put my finger on a couple of the main things that I've seen causing problems, one is, again, specific to creators, when the original label didn't capture information about who contributed on those recordings, by the time it, the catalogue changes hands, it's as good as gone forever. Because the entity that is responsible for keeping track of you know who played what so that the royalties can be can be to, you know paid off downstream by the time the the seller has kind of left the building or maybe they've even gone bust maybe they've disappeared completely it's almost impossible for that new owner to be able to go back down the chains of communication to find out who especially the session players were featured artists usually traceable through contracts and stuff that's not maybe such a problem but if there are session players that may be due something for subsequent exploitation, it's pretty unfair if those guys are not included in the conversation. So that's a big area and it's not ideal. The other area that's a little bit more complicated, but is a slightly more kind of good news story, I suppose, in my experience, is main, particularly around neighbouring rights. Now, this is not everyone's cup of tea and it's not something that I mean, it's something everyone needs to be aware of, but because it primarily refers to public performance, broadcast and kind of commercial secondary exploitation, usually, you know, it's kind of artists and labels of a particular level that see kind of decent money coming in through that. But nonetheless, for an individual creator, it's still really important to understand that there are different rights, particularly in the US, to basically the rest of the world. Now, what this means in terms of catalogue transfers is that if, let, so tiny little potted history, the US doesn't have for record companies and for recording artists on recordings, a right for terrestrial broadcast performance rights. So when a recording is played on FM radio in the US, only the authors get paid. There is no right for record companies and for recording artists on those recordings to be paid when their tracks are played on FM radio. It's the same story for public performance, you know, bars and grills, shops, clubs, etc. The rights do exist. There is a performance right for authors and publishers in the US. So that's why clubs have to get their licensing in place. But the labels and the recording artists there's no right. The US didn't sign the treaty that created the rights. The rights do not exist in the US. So what happens when a US label buys a catalogue of non-US qualifying recordings? I've seen on many occasions situations where because the US is only really dealing with US labels are very familiar with sound exchange, which collects for the rights that record companies and performers do have, which is for in non-interactive satellite and digital, not FM. It's a different type of kind of broadcast technology for which the rights do exist. A lot of the time labels overlook the fact that they've bought this foreign catalog and don't think about putting a plan in place to make sure that they've got their non-US performance rights covered. Because if the catalog comes from outside the US, let's say an American dance label buys the catalogue of a Dutch dance label, almost certainly, not 100%, but maybe 99.9% .9 of the, the, the time, you will find that those Dutch recordings will qualify for all the international rights, even if those rights don't exist in the US. So a US label will think, oh, as long as I've got them in sound exchange, I'm covered but actually they won't be covered necessarily. So the label needs to do something to plug in the foreign societies on the neighboring rights side to make sure that they're being paid for the overseas usage, which doesn't exist in the US. So that's, that, that's tricky. 
Um, you can have the, the kind of flip converse side as well, where, you know, US repertoire gets sold out of the US to, to other territories. And there'll be the same question where in some countries like France, that US repertoire may not qualify, even though the buyer's domestic repertoire being European may qualify. But no need to sort of blow minds over this. We're talking about data today. And I think the main takeaway really is the fact that as long as you've got all the information that is requested by the parties that need it, like PROs, like the CMOs, like your distributor, if you fill in every single thing you possibly can in terms of what's asked, it's really for the system and the institutions and the licensing organizations to take that information and they figure out whether or not there's a problem in the qualification criteria of a recording on broadcast in France. You really don't need to know that as a creator or a label because that's the job of the collective licensing organizations. So I think the kind of the, the message really is don't, don't be freaked out by the complexity of how some of the licensing and the legal stuff works because it is really complicated. But data is your friend for these sites of situations, because as long as you know, the collecting societies all know what they need to be told. So PRS know what they need. Boomer Stemmer, they know what they need. Give them what they need. They can then go off and do the job that they have, which is on your behalf, to make sure that they know what you've told them. So they know not just you know, the track title and all that stuff, but also some of the more fiddly stuff that will then allow them to go off and actually really dig in to make sure that you they are helping maximize your revenue on your behalf so i i would say data is your data is your friend with this um and again i think once once you start to really understand the kind of absolute sort of joined at the hip relationship between rights generating rights describing your property and data being the way that you actually articulate that ownership the data stuff gets a little bit less confusing because it's you know it, it's not just like endless lists of fields that need to be filled in by all these random organizations it's actually like, oh okay i now understand what my songwriting contribution was and what publishing was so now i know that i need to have an account with boomer stemra i mean when you're spending most of your time in the studio, you don't want to be spending time figuring out how the institutions of the international industry operate. It should be a lot easier, um, but it is still, you know, kind of localized and it's quite hard to navigate. Um, but I think, again, you know, on a kind of good news point, I think, yes, there are these issues that come along, but not only can data really help you. And if you make the effort to capture what you can, you can navigate your way through. But I think there's just a much better dialogue about all this annoying data and rights stuff than there's ever been before. Um, so I think in conclusion, I would just say if there are any sort of questions that are specific to any of these things for electronic, just just get in touch through Finley to us or anyone else who can help. And I'm sure we'll be able to help you navigate your way through. Yeah, thanks. And I think there's also maybe two tips and tricks that I would offer to artists that may be watching this back um, that I've seen you know, people fall foul of, unfortunately, is things like changing a distributor, moving from TuneCore to DistroKid or something, and not doing a re-delivery, if you will, of your data with the same ISRCs or not doing it ahead of the takedown. And actually that period being longer than 24 hours or whatever it may be, and then losing the streams, losing all of the play counts and things because it's effectively going out as a new recording. The DSP has lost the connective tissues there. Um, yeah which is always heartbreaking to see. And I've also seen folks sign up for, and I won't mention who it is because I don't want to make it feel like I'm shading them, but I'm not, where, you know, a, a distribution, indie distribution platform offers something like a five-year in advance, pay for this for five years, pay for your account for five years. And then after that, you're going to need to renew. And who's going to remember to renew their contract if, you know, maybe they don't have that email address anymore, that credit cards no longer exist in or whatever. And I've seen artists accounts go inactive at the distribution platform and then all their stuff get taken down and they lose all those counts as well. They never wrote down the ISRC. They don't even know. Right. So those are both heartbreaking examples. Um, but again, a reason why metadata is important. It's, it's important to know enough about this type of thing to, um, 
keep your music live, keep, keep those conversations going. And then if you do change labels or there are changes of ownership or things that are going on, you at least kind of know enough about what's going on to make sure that it's happening correctly for you. Um, and I think that also kind of bleeds into another topic that Charlie and I were discussing, which is what happens so, so commonly in electronic music again, maybe more than any other genre is having a different single out with a different label on a different distributor across like your whole catalog. You put something out with Spin in one day, you put something out with Armada, then you put something out with Stamped Records. Like you could have catalog in lots of different places and you're signing these sort of single only deals with people. So you don't have a central place to kind of manage or track all of your catalog, um, which also can get tricky if you're trying to do a lot of this stuff yourself. Um, and can also get tricky if rights do start reverting back to you and you now don't really know how you need to redistribute that one thing. You don't know if you have enough data. So that kind of falls into the catalog management, catalog transfer piece as well, um, just for people to be aware of. Like it is worth jotting down for yourself in a rainy day afternoon when you're stuck on something in the studio. Like let me spend two hours just trying to write everything down and who, who has my music and where is it? Um, just to make sure that you do have a, a record of all of that. Um, and I think the same goes for publishing too. Like there might be split catalogs where you're self-publishing, you self-published yeah. for a while under a name of a publisher that you registered with a CMO. And then you have a couple other tracks that are going through a publishing admin that are kind of separate. Um, you might be hopping on a publishing deal that's with your friend who's co-working and like on their publisher. So again, just making sure that you are aware of who is attributed to each of these things because it might not be as simple as like oh it's just always me as the publisher like make sure that's what that's what you said two years ago you know um and then the final kind of point well we have a couple points to go through but that I I really wanted to make sure came across is things like IDs that happen often so if you are playing and performing music that hasn't been released yet um which happens all the time like keeping a note of what those songs were, especially if those recordings are living on in some kind of form. For example, you released something on a DSP that's a compilation of a live DJ set that you did. And within that DJ set is something like ID number five, um, making sure that you're either taking the time to go back, well, this would be a deal thing to going back and re-releasing that compilation with the correct uh, track name and artist title and composer names. Um, but at the very least, trying to help uh, yourself, if you're the writer or the whoever is the writer, uh, make sure that that ISRC is attributed and sent to their CMO as representing that work. So eventually when the recording comes out, both from a discoverability point of view and just knowing, hey, I like this song, where can I go hear more of this artist? Um, but also from making sure that those rights actually do trickle back to them, metadata is really important for that. Um, and, and registering and trying to uh, let people know of all the different uses is also really important. So just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Um, and then Charlie, for you, because you were sending me a very cool thing that you were doing uh, in the last few days for your own music, um, <laughs> it's this idea of like the, the flow of music and the compilation, almost, if you will, of a live performance is in itself sometimes the only existence of that music there isn't maybe a release of a separate track and how you know how should we be mindful of those things how should we be trying to track those rights that might be existing in those live sets yeah. and it kind of bleeds a little bit into the next two webinars just for anyone that's curious the second webinar is going to be focused on um, the actual music users so publishers dsps etc um, and how kind of we can create better tools for ourselves in the industry and the third session is going to be on the future proofing of this. So this is touching a little bit on that future proofing of like, hey, if music consumption becomes this, you know, what does that look like? Um, but since it's so, so, so common for DJs to put music sets up together and kind of pop them on SoundCloud, I just wanted to get your take on what's going on there. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm conscious of time because it would be great to have some some Q&A and some input from, from everyone who's, who's present. Um, but I think just i mean just so everyone knows i mean I, I sent chloe a soundcloud link of a dj mix that i did of six of my own productions because i produce i'm one of the people that has to figure out where i sit in the in the shark butt diagram because i do all my own stuff on logic pro and i you know try and release stuff and 
I'm getting really bored of having to do individual single releases which require artwork and metadata. So I'm just kind of like, whatever. I'm just going to gather up a bunch of tracks that I've worked on. And I'm just going to mix them, record the mix and just fling it all up on SoundCloud as a single audio file, which is kind of friction free. But it's also kind of bad because there's no way that anyone else in the world knows what the in composite tracks are that I have mixed together. And there's no record of them anywhere because it's just a single audio file. So technically, there should be a single ISRC for that audio file, but that's not that much use if I was to try and release it somewhere because it's actually it's like six recordings, not one. So when do you need to assign an ISRC is a really important point. And the answer to that, to kind of demystify, is the audio file that you are releasing for some form of commercial benefit, whether it's a stem, a full mix, a sample, whatever, give it an ISRC. If it is the, if it's like lots of different recordings that together make up an immersive experience, but the end user cannot identify or doesn't really need to know what the individual things are, doesn't necessarily need an ISRC. That's the kind of bog standard rule. Lots of resources on this on the IFPI website and so on and so forth. But I think what's probably the most important is just to make sure that if you are releasing mixes of your or other people's music, just keep a note somewhere of what that was like, a, like a set list. Um, and I think something, again, we haven't talked about this, but we did mention it a while ago. I put together a kind of like a little Excel spreadsheet that just has the kind of common language terms of what a track is made up of, which you know, I've given that to artists that I've worked with who found it quite helpful to be able to be like, okay, I don't need to really blow my head off, but I've just come out of the session and I played sax on this track, but I sang on that one. And it's, you know, you can just have a little, like you were saying, Chloe, a little kind of sketch pad, plain language version of like who did what on a particular piece of music, just to be able to refer back to. Keeping, a, keeping track of an ISRC code if you are releasing or producing recordings is really important as well. Um, I think it, keeping a note of stuff manually is still data management. And ultimately, you know, you're trying to get what you know in your mind out there into some sort of record for the industry to be able to, to, to work from. So I think just keeping track of what you know what's in the mix if you like um and if you've if you're creating stuff yourself then i would definitely say make sure that when other collaborators come in just keep a note you don't have to get bogged down in publishing splits and negotiation of money and revenue the starting point is just who did what in the first place like the little three step slides that i put up earlier music is made up of different contributions so just keep track of those contributions and you'll have a starting point for being able to actually record properly who gets paid and what the data sort of requirements would be. Cool. And so I'll just quickly, as we're kind of closing down the and official yeah, sure. part of this <laughs> that will exist on uh, YouTube afterwards, if you have any questions for either of us, either Charlie or myself, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to kind of help you walk you through any specific uh, things that we didn't cover today. Um, and also there will be a link of resources where you can go find out more information about what these codes are that we're talking about, what's an ISRC, et cetera, and also some sort of regional uh, signposts for where you can go depending on your territory, et cetera, for companies that you might want to look into signing up for. So thank you everybody that came uh, and that will close the official part of our session. And I think we do have 